God, oh my God, this is like my deep dark secret that no one knows about and I can't believe that she asked this question. <laughs> I was a complete outcast in school, mm -hmm. didn't have a lot of friends, was picked on cons consistently. People really felt about me that I was this hyper-feminist and, and now, of course, we're all talking about it. I had held back a little bit even when Me Too was taking off because I felt that even though these other aspects of the entertainment industry were talking about problems, dance music in particular was staying very, very silent. After that, so many women reached out to me personally mm. to tell me their stories. And I'm talking about women artists that are A-listers. Hi, this is Lauren Engel of Sidewalk Talk. Today I'm here with Danny Deal. Hey, what's up? <laughs> So you're from Chicago, but your mom's from Sicily. Oh my gosh. Wow, you really did your homework. So the lineage is from Sicily. She's not from Sicily. Okay. A few generations back though. Yeah, my mom's side is from Sicily and she's actually gone to Sicily and dug in the local historical records. Yeah, I read that. Records. That's so cool that she did that. Yeah, so we actually discovered our family crest for the Ferrari side. Yeah. And my whole mom's side of the family, the names are all super Italian. There's Antoinette's and Peter's Whoa. and Joseph's and yeah. That's so cool. Mm -hmm. So, but all your extended family kind of are all in Chicago or? No, they're all over the country. Oh, wow, okay. I'm, I'm the last one left in Chicago. Everyone no way. moved. Yeah, they're all in Florida or in the near south. And I have family here in LA too. Yeah. So. <laughs> but it wasn't a musical upbringing, right? Not at all, no. Uh, I think my mom would be the first to admit that she can't hit a single note. <laughs> and uh, and my, my dad is not, in He's, well, he's sort of musically inclined, but, and he really likes dance music. He's tried to, to turn me on to some stuff. One time he asked me if I had heard of the Punk Daft, which I thought was really cute. <laughs> <laughs> so cute. Uh, oh he's definitely, he's put on Justin Bieber tracks and asked if I've heard of them before. So he Aww. does, he really, he loves pop music, but when I was growing up, it wasn't a big thing in our family. Mm -hmm. Music just wasn't really a part of what we did. What are their careers? or before? Um, my parents owned a commercial production company together. Oh, that's cool. Yeah, so they did TV commercials and it was tabletop, so all the Subway sandwich commercials, mm -hmm. they shot the beauty shots of the sandwiches. Oh, that's kind of creative though, right? Yeah, yeah, it is. So you kind of got your creative sense from them. Oh, they were definitely creative, yeah. for sure. And any creative thing that my brother and I wanted to do, they supported 100%. Mm. There was never any pressure for us to gravitate towards any career. Mm -hmm. Were your friends in school into music? Mm. Sort of. I, uh, I was more, I was a very moody teenager and as a result was into very moody music at the time, like mm. Fiona Apple and Portishead and all of that. But really I became very attached to music when I started going to raves and that was because I was a complete outcast in school, mm -hmm. didn't have a lot of friends, was picked on cons consistently um, and when I say picked on I mean there was one time where I was supposed to go to a dance with a guy that I had a crush on and he actually stood me up. He called me the day of the dance and said what? that he was not going to come and pick me up because it would be bad for his reputation to be seen with me. What even? Yeah, and I wound up dating someone who was a raver and he wanted to introduce me to the scene. And the first step I took inside the party, I finally felt like I found a commonality with other people. Mm -hmm. And I just grew to love the music through that. How old were you when that happened? Mm -hmm. Maybe 16 or 17. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so you just hated everything about school, like you didn't like it or? Yeah, I mean, I was, I was good at school. Mm -hmm. I was a great student, oh, but wow. I didn't feel like I fit in anywhere. And it was a really small school. I only had 92 or 93 kids in my graduating class. So if you didn't oh fit gosh. in, it was a very conspicuous thing to mm -hmm. not fit in. Yeah. Did you have some sort of career plan? Like, did you know that you wanted to be in music one way or another? I fell into everything that I'm doing now. I never went to school for journalism. I only took 
one music theory class in college, I really fell into the concurrent career of music and journalism by chance. So there used to be a print magazine called URB Magazine, for mm -hmm. URB, like urban. And I submitted that they do an article on me and a DJ that I was dating at the time for their Valentine's issue. So I thought it'd be really cute. <laughs> yeah. And they bit on it. So they wrote, they wrote us up and I self edited the piece and sent it into them. And I didn't know that that wasn't normal. I was just trying to make it easier for yeah. them. And they, <laughs> they saw some promise there. So they asked if I wanted to do some freelance work and I did. And then I learned how to write articles properly by sending my work in and then I would get the print magazine three or four weeks later and then I would compare what I'd sent in to oh, how they edited it. Interesting. Yeah. But before that, were you you were finding a lot of music or shows through like record stores, right? Or like forums, mm -hmm. that yeah. sort of thing. Yep. Is that how, did you meet people in music mm -hmm. kind of like networking wise or like in your career through those events or? Yeah, I mean definitely at that time it was the house music, well it's still the house, it's always the house music <laughs> in Chicago. But at the time, the, the people that I really looked up to were Super Jane, the collective with Colette and mm -hmm. DJ Heather and all of them, uh, Diz, Mark Farina, uh, Derek Carter, all of these greats and I would run into them while I would crate dig at the record store. Mm. Yeah, and a couple of companies took me under their wing and started placing me at clubs for different residencies and once I had the residencies it became much easier for me to continue to network and meet people and yeah mm -hmm. I, I was really lucky in that I had a lot of people around me that believed in me from a very early stage and did what they could to help facilitate what I wanted. Mm -hmm. Can you describe your first performance? Was it kind of awful. like... Was, so was it like this... Um, like hunting mm -hmm. or yeah yeah I did I had been practicing DJing uh, at a friend's house sitting on the floor the turntables were on the floor I would go over bring my records and I didn't even know that I wanted to DJ at parties I was just interested in the act of DJing and I thought it was cool so a friend of mine was like screw this Danny's never gonna do this on her own so I'm just gonna book her for a party and not tell her about it Oh, so. that's what happened. <laughs> yeah. Because I wasn't going to take, I probably wouldn't have taken the plunge myself, so mm -hmm. he shoved me into the pool. Yeah. And so I had no choice. I had to do it. I drove out by myself. It was in the middle of nowhere. It sounds Midwest. amazing, though. Yeah. <laughs> I wish I could go to one of those. God, I remember I had to stop and ask for directions, and it was this really dingy old bar filled with old old guys that they looked at me fresh face coming in with my bleach buzz cut at the time 17 years old like hey guys you know where the rave is at <laughs> but it wound up being in this abandoned hunting lodge they, they had stuffed ducks on the wall crazy. And yeah it was crazy and I, I really severely screwed up during that set because I was so nervous my hands were shaking I couldn't beat match the first record in time and I ran I just ran on a vinyl it, and they were really supportive. The crowd just mm. was like, come on, Danny, like you can do it. Yeah. And so I just started the record again and I uh, was able to get through the set. And I mean, that was amazing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What did your parents think of you? Like for your career, were they open for you? Because before mm -hmm. that, like what kind of career, I know I asked like the question before, but like, what did you have anything in mind? Like, I know you like came into a lot of this, but like, did you, like, what were you thinking that you could earn from or like have a living <laughs> off of? I, you know, it's funny because I, like I said, I was, I was really lucky in that I, I fell into it and was able to figure out a way to monetize things mm -hmm. pretty early on. Um, I, by the time I graduated high school, I had pretty solidified a good residency schedule and I was traveling and touring. Oh, so they weren't worried, like they, they already knew no. that you were already making money, okay. No, yeah, that makes from, sense. from a very early age, my parents sort of knew that I I was the one where they were like, we can be hands off with Danny. she, she figures stuff out, mm -hmm. she's gonna be fine. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and then, so you were doing the residency and writing at the same time, mm -hmm. yeah. 
And how, how long were you doing that for? Quite a long time. And then when, once Herb Magazine folded, uh, I wrote freelance for a few outlets and then went to DJ Mag and was editor at large for DJ Mag North America for, mm -hmm. for two years. Yeah. How old were you when your parents got you Logic for Christmas? I was in high school. Mm -hmm. And yeah. then uh, were you just looking at like online tutorials or how were you teaching yourself? There were no online tutorials. <laughs> Not <Man>. even forums? <laughs> I mean, yeah, if I had a specific, uh, specific thing I needed to troubleshoot, then sure, I could go to an online forum, but mm -hmm. there were, what is this? <laughs> <laughs> sure, why not? <laughs> oh, Kevin! It's a Chemical Brothers CD. Oh my gosh. Dope. I not love even them. There. there was like no one. Is it this guy? No. It's <laughs> like funny around people. Oh, it's just like, the case. Oh. <laughs> uh, <laughs> damn. You want to put it back? Nah, whatever. I'm still. I'm walking with it. Whatever. <laughs> I made that choice. <laughs> <laughs> Follow through with your choices. <laughs> Were you putting music out? Yeah, I was. Uh, and, and I have I have a couple of records that never came out because I signed bad contracts because I didn't have anyone to look over documentation mm -hmm. for me at the time. So I signed away my rights to a couple of early records and they never came out. And then legally they weren't they didn't have to put them out, but they owned oh. the songs. So yeah, but I was making music at the time and I turned, I had a little walk-in closet and I converted that into a makeshift vocal booth. Mm -hmm. So I'd record some people in there and used eMagic for quite, uh, eMagic Logic was, used to be owned, Logic used to be owned by eMagic before Apple bought it, so, <laughs> which is a German company. And I used Logic for quite a long time before I switched over to Ableton. Mm. Yeah. Did you ever have a moniker? Mm. <laughs> yes. <laughs> oh my gosh, it's so bad. <laughs> I had to because okay, so at the time when I first started DJing, I was going to raves every weekend and I didn't want people to look at the name on the flyer and say, "Oh yeah, that's Danny. We just saw her at the Harvey Expo at that rave last weekend." I wanted something to separate me at the parties from me performing because mm. I was going to parties all the time so I just went to a baby name book and yeah. I just started flipping through because I didn't have a lot of time because my friend had booked me for that party without telling yeah. me so I needed to tell the promoter what to put on the flyer <laughs> <laughs> and, god oh my god this is like my deep dark secret that no one knows about and I can't believe that she asked this question <laughs> awful <laughs> So what I decided upon was DJ Solange, which is hor it's so bad. It's so bad. Salon. Solange. Oh so oh, okay. That's yeah. not bad. Oh uh, I don't know. Maybe I think it's worse because I ha I've had to live with that for a long time mm. and it reminds me of a certain period of my life where mm. <laughs> But yeah. I and no, I mean, yeah, I didn't want to go by my real name, so I went by DJ Solange. <laughs> and uh, yeah, obviously I don't do that anymore and What was the turning point that you dropped it? Um, well, Beyonce's sister helped with that decision quite a lot. <laughs> <laughs> she can have it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and once I started to really develop myself as an artist, I just figured, you know, my parents did really good by me. Danny Deal sounds great. Yeah. And why not just build the brand around my actual name? Mm-hmm. How were you like building the brand back in the day? I've always I've always tried to make sure that I, I have a platform and build a brand where people can look at what I do and feel good about what I'm doing. I think sometimes some people don't realize that when you are a public figure, you have a certain responsibility. People look up to you, right? Mm -hmm. And I just, I've always wanted to be somebody that people felt good about liking. And, and then also, ad, from day one, advocacy has always been a big thing for me too. And so I baked that into the brand pretty early and that's 
now that's worked out really good. For yeah. a while it was very touch and go and people people really felt about me that I was this hyper feminist and and now of course we're all talking about it and it's like oh this is actually an issue. What kind of articles were you writing early on? Well er early early on when I was with Herb I yeah. was the house section editor so I was getting all of the demos that were sent to the magazine and writing reviews of the singles mm. and things like that. And now I try to really stick to just big stories, mm -hmm. features. Was it difficult writing reviews, like reviewing people's music initially? It is. Yeah. It's, it's really difficult to take something that you hear and try to, especially if someone, if someone is not that savvy with music, mm -hmm. how do you describe to them what a Skrillex womp sounds mm -hmm. like, right? What yeah. words do you use to emulate that in someone else's brain? Mm -hmm. So it becomes really a, a really good exercise in just expanding your vocabulary and because there's only so many ways you can describe a, a kick drum. Yeah. <laughs> Have you had scenarios early on that you're reviewing music by people you knew? Yeah, yeah, hundred percent. Was yeah. that difficult? No, I've I've never you just had, always separate the two. Or yeah, I've yeah. never had a problem telling people what my honest opinion is mm -hmm. on tracks. But I think that's why a lot of people come to me for feedback mm -hmm. because they know I'm not a yes person. Mm -hmm. If if you're working on something and I think it's problematic or something needs to be changed I'm not gonna tell you it's great mm hmm and so it was mostly like print right so for it was mostly print, yeah. and even with DJ mag that was print too. yeah what were you reading at that time that inspired the articles that you wrote hmm this is interesting I'm trying to think of some of the earlier features that I did I think probably, I mean, really, the. I, it wasn't that I was reading other things that were inspiring me, it was that I was actually living the things that I was writing about. Mm. And so I, I became, especially during the time when I had my Hype Machine blog too, my skill with writing about music is that I have a very good sense of who is going to make it big and blow up. Mm. So with the blog, when I had the Hype Machine blog, I was one of the first people to write and push Flostradamus and Kill the Noise and the Chainsmokers and the Knox and all of these people that, of course, went on to become yeah. really prolific artists. Mm -hmm. And then same thing with, with DJ Mag. We were, uh, for a section that we have that's for talking about up and coming people, I was like, we have to write about Louis Child, we have to write about Ikala, we have to write about Josh Pan, all of these people that went on to do really great things. Has the style of your writing changed over time, like either print or online? Yeah, I've gotten really good at being, so it's, the, well there's two different sides to that. If I'm writing for an audience like DJ Mag, mm -hmm. there's an assumed level of knowledge. Someone who picks up a copy of DJ Mag yeah. already knows a little bit about the culture and some of the vocabulary associated with that. Mm -hmm. If I'm writing for someone like The Verge, those people, I have to assume they know nothing about the music industry. Mm -hmm. And that's actually been very interesting because there are some very technical things that I have to write about, but I have to write it in a way where if someone knew nothing about the topic, they wouldn't feel shut out. Mm -hmm. And that's something I think is missing with a lot of music writing, especially music technology writing, is that it's written inward for an insular audience that already knows the topic that's being talked about. And so what I'm trying to do, especially with The Verge, is to write things in a way that opens it up so that anyone feels like they can access that topic and learn something. Mm -hmm. Were you ever afraid of like difficulties getting journalist jobs when like more and more like blogs were like shutting down or No. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. I wasn't. <laughs> I'm uh I I wasn't afraid simply because I know I'm really good at what I do. Mm -hmm. I have a very good history 
and people know that they can trust what I say. Mm -hmm. And the three of those things combined, I think, um, are pretty valuable when you work in journalism. Mm -hmm. What did you think of the whole hype um thing about like all the reposts and everything? About uh, what do you mean? Or like um, people like making a lot of accounts and like getting trying to get their articles trending. Maybe like they're managing an artist, but they're also an editor. Oh yeah, total conflict of interest, right? Yeah. Yeah. Was it annoying to see the whole thing unfold to you? I mean, they're, they weren't even like really journalists themselves, like random no. people. Right, they're, yeah, they're, there's all sorts of ethical conflicts that happen with blogs and still continue to happen with blogs. Blogs that run SoundCloud accounts where they charge for a repost, mm -hmm. that would be an ethical conflict. Um, it's an ethical conflict if you want somebody to pay to submit their song. Mm -hmm. So it, there's just all of these these standards that that are lowered or have been lost, and that's one thing that I really appreciate about working for The Verge is that we have a very strict ethical policy. Mm -hmm. So I'm not allowed to take any product from companies. Uh, anything I review, I have to actually send back to them. So when Native Instruments sent me the Machina for review, I got to play with it for a few weeks and then I had to send it back to them. <laughs> yeah, I had to cut my headphone sponsorship because that was a conflict of interest. Oh, wow. Yeah. So it's a, uh, it sucks to not get free product, but at the other time it makes it so that you know that what you're reading isn't tainted by any bias. Mm. And how did you get that job at Verge? Uh, they were they were looking for somebody in culture and I was I was pretty interested I love the brand to begin with and I, I wanted to be associated with a, a much bigger brand mm -hmm. and the verge is one of the biggest and most trafficked websites in the US yeah so I, I just reached out to them. Turned out the editor in chief is a fellow Midwesterner, oh. and we had some friends in common. And <laughs> so I, I just I applied. Turned out they actually he saw a different vision for me. He's like, I really want to hire a DJ. The editor in chief really loves electronic music, and he was like, I really want to hire a DJ. I was the second DJ he hired, and it became this joke. They were like, You've got to stop hiring DJs. <laughs> uh, but they saw they saw a need with The Verge, a whole, because they cover all sorts of technology. But the one thing that I that I could provide that, and beef up for them was this mm. whole of music and technology. And so they I they wound up creating a, a role for me. Mm -hmm. And it's on YouTube also. Or well, that's that? separate. That's yeah. yeah so I, I hosted I host a, a series on YouTube that's called The Future of Music. Mm -hmm. And if you couldn't guess, it's about music. <laughs> <laughs> and that, that's, that's been really very, very fascinating because there's such a divide between the technology that's being worked on for musicians to use mm -hmm. and what musicians are actually aware of in the technology space. Mm -hmm. So we did an episode on AI, for example. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. That's cool. Because... Whoop, there's all of these different companies like IBM, Google, whatever, that are making these systems that can generate music on their own for mm -hmm. you to use. But a lot of musicians don't know about it. And it's very scary to them. Mm. But it shouldn't be scary. Yeah. It's not. A lot of these companies view AI as a tool that can help you in the studio to eliminate some of the tasks that are boring and repetitive for you. Mm -hmm. Not replace what you're doing. So that, that was like one thing where there was a wide gap between the technologies being developed and what musicians are actually aware of. And then we did one on VR concerts. Mm -hmm. So you would just, instead of actually going to a concert, you would just put on an Oculus or a Vive headset and log into the concert. <laughs> <laughs> so cool. Yeah, it is. It's super cool. Mm -hmm. <laughs> what was the inspiration behind Girls Rock? Oh, the nonprofit? Yeah. Yeah, Girls Rock is an amazing nonprofit in Chicago where they have a camp every year and mm -hmm. they had started a DJ program. It, it was just a band component to begin with. 
So they take all these kids that are, I think, between the ages of like maybe eight and 13 or 14, uh, young, young girls, young women, and over the course of a week, they try to teach them how to play instruments. And the goal is by the end of the week to have them perform a song together as a band. Mm -hmm. And so they started a DJ factor to that. And I just, they reached out, they wanted me to get involved. I was like, hell yeah, <laughs> anything I can do to help the next generation mm -hmm. of ladies kill it in the field, I'm all about it. Yeah. And it was super rewarding. I got to teach these kids how to do basic beat matching mm -hmm. with equipment and yeah, it was, so it was cool. a lot of fun. And how about the Show Me Your Kittens? Cause you did the whole tour from scratch, right? Yeah, Show Me yeah. Your Kitties. Yeah. Oh, kitties, yeah. <laughs> Oh my god. <laughs> yeah, now you get the fun. <laughs> how did it how did you make it come together from scratch? I had a I secured a small team that helped me with some of the logistics. And it's it, you know, it can be really difficult if you are a mid-tier artist trying to do your own routing. Mhm. Mm uh, especially if you want to, it's, it's fine to book one gig and fly out for a week and fly home, but if you want to do a run of 30 dates or so, and you are a mid-tier artist where, oh, let's say your, your ask is three to five K all in, mm -hmm. it's, it's hard to find a good manager or agent that's willing to take that on because the money that they would get from that would be not a lot so I was like fuck it I'm pretty sure that I can do this on my own mm -hmm. I can find out who the promoters are on the nights that I want to play at I know what clubs I want to play at I looked at similar artists and looked at their touring histories mm -hmm. and found out what clubs and nights they would play at so smart and then I would look up who the promoters were yeah and then I would find out who the people were that worked for that promotion company and I would hit them up personally and just put in the hard work to to route and book it all myself yeah that's so cool I feel like a lot of people watching this probably like also mid-size and that's like would be like really inspirational yeah for them I mean, to it's figure entirely, it out on their own yeah it's entirely possible it's really everything is about finding the right person to talk to whether it's getting a gig or getting an article on a website, right? Like, mm -hmm. I always tell people, if you want to get press on a website, don't just email the general email that they have on their contact page. Mm -hmm. Find out what writer is writing about music that is similar to yours. Figure out what their Twitter handle is, see if you can find their email address, try to get in contact with that person individually, yeah. and build a relationship there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But it's the same with, with the clubs. I'm not going to email the club and ask if I can play. I'm going to find out what night is most appropriate for me, if there's a promoter attached to that night, who the people are that work for the promotion company, and then talk to those people, because yeah. they make the decisions. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And changing topics a bit, what gave you the confidence to treat or share about your experience of what happened with Tony? Oh. <laughs> uh, that was when, that was when I was seeing people within the dance music community finally start to tell their own stories. Mm -hmm. I had held back a little bit even when Me Too was taking off because I felt that even though these other aspects of the entertainment industry were talking about problems, dance music in particular was staying very, very silent. Mm -hmm. And I, I wanted there to be other people that were telling their stories so that it wouldn't just be the person who historically talks about women's issues in dance music is the one that is griping or complaining. So I think there was that thing about the gas lamp killer yeah. that came out, a couple other stories. And at that point, because people within the dance music community were finally snapping their heads around and saying, oh my gosh, what's this? This is, this is happening with the people that I follow, the people that mm -hmm. I know, that yeah. I go to see at shows. And so I felt like that was the appropriate time because our community was finally starting to pay attention. Was the feedback from it like a lot of girls were supportive and it encouraged them to... Everybody yeah. was super, super supportive. The only, the only bad thing really is that after that, 
so many women reached out to me personally mm -hmm. to tell me their stories. And I'm talking about women artists that are A-listers. No way. Wow. And they wanted someone to confide in. Wow. And so they saw when they saw that I had posted mine, they would send their stories to me privately. But most of those stories even never came out. So I'm I know that there are a lot of other stories out there that have not been told yet. Mm. But it's not up to me to tell yeah. it. I think we're finally at a place where people are talking about it and it's not being dismissed, mm. right? Um, we have a long way to go. There is a yeah. lot of stuff that needs to be fixed, mm -hmm. but people are listening. Mm. And the fact that people are listening is a major turning point. Yeah. Because it used to be, we would tell people that there were these problems that were going on and guys would be like, oh yeah, sure, okay, whatever. Mm -hmm. That's all That's all in your head, it's mm -hmm. no big deal. And now for whatever reason, I guess because everybody's sharing these stories publicly, they have no choice but to listen. Mm -hmm. I mean, I've had, did you see that Twitter thread where someone asked the question, hey women, what would you do if men had a curfew? at 9 p.m. No, I don't think I did. Yeah, yeah, it went it went viral. Yeah. And all the responses were women saying, oh my gosh, I would I would go jogging through the park. I would walk by myself oh, at night. Oh my god. That just sounds so nice. I'm like Right? Yeah. <laughs> and I've had guy friends in the industry look at that thread and just they have this moment that just blows their mind and they're like, my God, women are actually like they walk around with this fear all the time yeah. and I'm like bro I've been telling you this for so long <laughs> <laughs> how about in terms of opportunities yeah the opportunities are becoming greater mm -hmm. there's a lot of people that are being mindful about inclusion mm -hmm. which I really like um, in, like for example Gary Richards mm -hmm. Destructo yeah when he threw that holy ship pre-party, I think it was last year maybe, mm -hmm. and the lineup was all women, but it wasn't posited as such. It was just, here's a lineup full of dope ass yeah. DJs. They all happen to be women, but you know, who yeah. cares, right? So cool. They're amazing. <laughs> so I'm seeing, I'm seeing more of that happen, and we do, like I said, we do have a long way to go. There are still festivals where I see one woman artist or zero women artists. Mm -hmm. um, I think there needs to be more inclusivity when it comes to being mindful of queer artists as well. Yeah. Uh, and minorities in, in all forms. And for your TED talk, you didn't know about it until like, what, a few days before or mm -hmm. something? Yeah. Did you, uh, how did it happen? They reached out to me. So and cool asked if I had a topic in mind and of course the <laughs> of course you have <laughs> right the, the natural thing was to talk about uh, women in dance music mm -hmm. and so I, I had four days to research and prepare and memorize a uh, 15 minute speech wow. and it was the most terrifying thing I've done in my entire it's so life good. <laughs> <laughs> I just I have this mantra in life where if an opportunity comes up and even if it's something that's scary and you've never done it before mm -hmm. and the idea of doing it shakes you to your core you should still say yes because if you say no you'll never know if you're capable of doing the yeah. thing to begin with right yeah so it's better to do the thing and if you fail You've learned. You've still learned. Mm -hmm. And if you succeed, then wow, how amazing is that, yeah. right? Then you, you know you're capable of doing it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so the TED Talk, I'd never done a speech in public before. That was my first public speech. <laughs> did, the, did the thing. Had I had the, you can see in my hand, I have folded up paper and that was the printed out speech in case I ever forgot <laughs> where I was. Mm -hmm. Didn't forget. Not a single moment. Pulled the whole thing off. It's the same thing when I played a couple weeks ago. I played with uh, with Fall Out Boy at Wrigley Field, and I'd never done a stadium show. And open format is not my strong suit. And they gave me, I think, three or four days notice for that. But it's playing for Fall Out Boy, <laughs> and it's playing at Wrigley Field, oh which gosh. is such a major. It's such a historic landmark. Yeah. Not many people ever get to play in Wrigley Field, so I was like, yeah, of course. 
totally got this. Mm. Yeah, put me on the bill. <laughs> I love that. You probably get this question a lot, but what do you think is the future of journalism and dance music? Mm. <laughs> I think dance, dance music is one of the few places in journalism that hasn't fully explored video as a format yet. <gasps> That's all I'm thinking about. I know. <laughs> Like for real. <laughs> right, it's true. It's, I find it very interesting. I mean, of course, that's been the the tagline in media for the past couple of years is pivot to video. I know. Right? That term is just like ingrained in my head. Right? <laughs> like everyone's saying it. But why do you think that is? Um, well. Or like why do you think EDM hasn't pivoted? Because it, take, it takes money. and <laughs> It takes... Uh, but I mean... You could shoot stuff like this, it doesn't cost that much. No, it doesn't. Yeah. But then you need someone that is good with editing and can package it in a in a way that is consumable and uh, captures people's interests and uh, knows how to do graphics and title cards and... But I feel like even like World Star Hip Hop, it's like really low mm -hmm. quality, but there's just... Oh, I'm not... I, I mean, I don't follow World Star oh. on YouTube. They follow me on Twitter. But <laughs> uh, I feel like hip hop has just been like super good on it. Oh yeah, Complexes, yeah. YouTube is amazing. They post so many videos every day that are just one or two minute news segments, just little bites, right? Mm -hmm. And Billboard does the same thing. They're really good about their YouTube and They're doing really little bite-sized videos. Yeah. Um, yeah, so I don't know, maybe they just need to get hip to it. Yeah. I, I don't know, but I, and I, also, let me put this out there. I don't think that video is actually going to be a true replacement for the written word. Mm -hmm. I think it's going to be a complement and something that is going to be another vertical that places will have to address. But we're still going to read. I really mm -hmm. think we're still going to read. Yeah. Yeah. But we have to be better at writing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> How would you say you've grown as a person compared to when you were younger? I think I'm much better now about giving zero fucks about what people think about me. Mm -hmm. I used to be incredibly concerned with how people perceived me. If people had a negative reaction to me, or if they thought poorly of me for whatever reason, or if they misinterpreted something I said, I really, really took it to heart and internalized it. And now I... <laughs> Frankly, my dear, I don't give a damn. I mean, I just don't. <laughs> yeah. I really don't. I mean, my mom always told me, that, look, if you can if you can stand by your own actions and your own words, and you know you did and said the right thing, it doesn't matter what anyone else says mm -hmm. or what anyone else does. Because you can only control what you put out into the universe, but you can't control other people's reactions to it. Mm -hmm. What would you say have been your biggest challenges so far in life? Hmm... <sighs> I think one of my biggest one of my biggest challenges has nothing to do with external forces. It has to do with internal self doubt and imposter syndrome. Mm. I had to battle that for a really long time. Um, I think a lot of creative people battle with imposter syndrome and wondering whether they deserve the attention that is given to them. Mm -hmm. And. Then probably. But what advice that. do you have for people who are going through imposter syndrome? I think if okay, this is this is difficult because it, sometimes it's not as easy as just saying "buck up and believe in yourself," right? That's mm -hmm. a very easy thing to say. It has to come from within. If you trust your creative process and other people are responding to it then you're on to something, right? Mm -hmm. And you, just, you have to believe in the fact that other people are responding to it and own it, just really, just own it. Um, and that, I mean, it can be such a hard thing to do to... I'm trying to think how I got over it. Hmm. I guess, okay. If you really wanted to get over imposter syndrome, you have to take a step back from what you're doing and really just shake, you have to physically sh just shake yourself out of that mentality. Believe that you're good enough. Believe that the work that you're doing is worthy of attention. Uh, if you're not gonna believe in yourself, no one else is gonna do it for you, right? That has mm -hmm. to start with you. And 
if you are not pumped about what you're doing or if you doubt where you're coming from, it's a lot harder for everyone else to buy into what you're doing, right? Mm -hmm. So that self-confidence has to come. It has to come from here first. It will radiate outwards and people will notice that. Mm, I love that. Last question. What do you want to be remembered for? I really hope that I make an impact in terms of gender equality in dance music. Mm -hmm. I really want to be remembered for helping to even the playing field and get more women involved and make women feel empowered to participate in dance music in every level, whether that's stage managing, production, journalism, uh, tour managing, whatever it is. And I want to make dudes more aware that they need to help <laughs> because the onus should not be on us. We've already had the struggle. This is our mm. daily life. We go through it, right? Yeah. So I want to empower women and I want to make guys aware that they need to help support us and take notice and be a part of the solution as well. I love this. This is so much fun. <laughs> Thank you so much. Yeah, of course. <laughs> Bye. Bye.